Welcome to the fifth lecture of Micro Nano and Solid Mechanics and MEC 4425. We're going to be talking about uh, clean rooms in this particular lecture. And the idea is, is that if you're working in this field and on these scales, you need to be able to work in environments that are controlled in such a way that you're able to, to, to see these types of structures that we're showing on this particular picture. Let me switch here. So, for example, I have a 50 nanometer dense line. So, the the line, the distance between these lines is 50 nanometers. If you think of uh, typical human hair, it's 50 microns, and so you go from 50 microns to 50 nanometers. Well, that's an, that's a thousand times uh, smaller in width. So, you could put a thousand of these these structures side by side, and that would still be only the the diameter of a human hair. So you can imagine that if you dropped a human hair across here, how huge that would be, and the potential for damage that you can see on the structure. Similarly, these each these pillars are about 60 nanometers uh, apart, and so the distance here is uh, about 60 nanometers. And in similar sort of situation, the sub 40 nanometer contacts, 20 nanometer line, and so on and so forth. So, for example, the 20 nanometers, you're only looking at maybe a thousand atoms at most across the structure, and the only way that you ever really look at these types of structures or even make them is whenever you're working in extremely clean environments. Now, so far you've heard plenty about microfluidics, a bit about scaling, and you're going to hear more about the solid side of things from, from here on out. But one part of it that's really important to think about in, in all of these things is, is how do you go about making practical devices? And you know, at the end of the day, you have to be able to make something that does uh, something useful. And it's good to know to learn about all the theory and so forth, but if, if for it to be useful, uh, it has to be practical, and it has to be made from some sort of gadget. So at millimeter larger scales, manufacturing can be considered after the physics and design are finished. So in a lot of the work that you've been doing in today, you can talk about physics and design and equations and motion and modeling and all of that, and leave that alone. And then afterwards, then go and talk about, well, what it is you're going to make. So this is how, and then the other part is what. And at micro and smaller scale, how you make something is just as important as why, because they're intimately related to each other. So the the title slide was was made through imprint lithography and it's a special technique. And imprint lithography has the potential to fabricate molecular scale features. And lines fifty to twenty nanometers in wide and so on and so forth are made with what's called soft imprint lithography. S fill is another popular acronym for this. And the only limit on the scale of the features produced with this technique has been the ability to make templates with fine enough features. So if you remember from uh, last time when I was talking about uh, the, the micro-robotics, or the nano-robotics idea, it's the it's a master device. That's what's important. How do we make the master? Once you have the master machine, then you can go and make a whole bunch of other devices from that master. The trick is making the very first one. So this type of structure is quite easy to make once you have the very first one. But the the idea here is that we actually use imprinting techniques to imprint structures, sort of like the intaglio process. Intaglio, um, that you feel like when you take a typical Australian $10 bill and it has those raised features on it. Well, this is just taken to its extreme limit. The objectives of this particular lecture include understanding the importance of cleanliness and its definition in the context of small manufacturing. As you might imagine, uh, people being the way they are, there's a whole bunch of uh, definitions and very specific meanings of what we're talking about cleanliness with, when you're t talking about working at micro and nano scales. All right, and we'll talk about the general process of machining at these scales. And this probably could take at least four years of study in and of itself, you probably get the PhD, and many people do, 
Um, for example, the, the the journal of micro machining is one such uh, journal, and uh, it's a very high impact journal, and it talks totally about how to make st structures at small scales. And we'll talk about learning specific methods common to making micro nano, nano devices to date. So there are specific things that we can do and differentiate between different machining methods and their suitability and economy for specific purposes. And really with this we can only just have an introduction. Now one thing I want you to remember is, is that though this, these structures look like they're really impressive, they're made by humans. And so this is really kind of fascinating how you could make such small structures and wow, these people must really be smart. When you think about, think about it, what they're talking about is lithography. Well, I'm sorry to say that 1834 was when lithography was really first started uh, to be used, and this is an example of one of the very first drawings of lithography, and it's arguable which one actually looks more impressive, this one or the one at right. And it's pretty cool uh, at the right, don't you think? And compared to a bunch of just, looks like, a bunch of bumps. So the point of it is, is that all of this advanced structure and manufacturing techniques actually dates from a very long time ago, back before people knew anything about most of what we're talking about on the left-hand side. It's not as big a deal as, as some people would make it out to be. Let's talk about clean rooms first. In particular, the importance of cleanliness is, uh, is really quite uh, impressive. Taking a typical example, uh, in the lecture halls, at Monash University and in other places, and maybe you have one at home, uh, you have digital light projectors that use uh, small chips that are composed of, of small mirrors. So, for example, this is an example of chip, and these are three different models uh, with three different uh, device sizes. This is actually the, the physical device itself here that I'm outlining in red, and you notice that one is slightly larger than this one, of course, and more expensive than the left one. And the idea is that if you look very closely in here, there's actually a collection of, of mirrors. And, and say for a, a nice high quality screen, a 1280 by 1024, and then you have three colors for each of those, and you're looking at about 3.9 million elements. And sometimes they might call this a more four megapixel, something like that, uh, for an element. And this is um, made by Texas Instruments, and you'll hear them called digital light projector systems. Of this, what they've done is they've spent a tremendous amount of money uh, to develop this on the order of billions to capture of U.S. dollars to capture the market in such a way that almost all of the digital light projector systems, uh, most projectors in the in the in the world, actually use these these reflector devices. And I'll show you a picture of how it works later. But this is a picture of one of these types of devices. The idea is fairly simple. But you have your your light source, and this is just pure white light. And the light source actually comes through a, a lens that that reduces the diameter of the lens of the light, and the light travels through and goes into a reflection prism, and the light makes a, a left-hand turn, and is reflected off of these these dynamic mirror displays, dynamic uh, 